the third lecture will be with heart lung transplant with Dr. Andrea. Uh, Dr. Ghada and the panel will be Dr. Abdullah Shahri and Dr. Mustafa al uh, Dr. Ghada, you can start uh, now if you like. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, everybody? Today, my lecture is regarding the heart transplant. It's uh, interesting to review uh, some history and uh, of the heart transplant and the advancement. In uh, 1905, uh, Alex uh, Carroll uh, performed the first heterotopic uh, canyon hunter transplant. In 1946, uh, Valdimir uh, Mikov uh, successfully implanted the first intra-thoracic uh, heterotopic uh, heart allograft. Dr. Shamway in 1950 uh, performed orthotopic uh, heart transplant in dog with cardiopulmonary bypass, preservation of the donor heart by immersion uh, for five minutes in uh, four degrees saline. They standardized the surgical technique. In 1960, reporting that five of eight animals survived for 21 days without immunosuppression. Uh, the first human cardiac transplant uh, was a uh, chimpanzee uh, xenograft performed at University uh, of Mississippi by uh, James Hartley in 1964. Primate heart was unable to maintain the recipient circulating uh, load and uh, died several hours postoperatively. Uh, Christian Bernard uh, surprised the world when perform performed the first human to human heart transplant in 16, uh, 1967. Endomyocardial biopsy by Philip Caves in uh, 1973. Uh, finally, provide a reliable means for monitoring allograft rejection. Uh, here we can uh, see uh, from 1988, uh, uh, the number of the transplant peaked until uh, reaching plateau then peaked again. Uh, in the recipient uh, selection, the uh, uh, Evaluation of the potential candidates for cardiac transplant is performed by the multidisciplinary committee to ensure the uh, executable, objective, and medically justified allocation of the donor organs to those uh, patients most likely to achieve long-term benefits. The basic objective is to identify those relatively healthy patients with end cardiac um, disease, refractory to other appropriate medical and surgical therapies, who um, have the potential to resume a normal active life and maintain compliance with the rigorous medical regimen after cardiac transplantation. Here uh, we can uh, see in terms of the statistics from uh, 1982 to uh, 2018, uh, the majority of the cases uh, was non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, around 40% uh, is um, uh, ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. The remaining percentage uh, for the other uh, reason, uh, congestive heart failure uh, and um, heteropathic cardiac uh, cardiomyopathy. In the last uh, 10 years, uh, minor changes uh, actually uh, decreased the number of the ischemic cardiomyopathy as a cause and increased in non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, regarding uh, of the age uh, of the recipient uh, by year, majority of the patient uh, was uh, between 40 and less than uh, 60, with slightly increased median age, uh, uh, reaching with uh, 53. We can see also some transplanted uh, patient more than uh, age of more than 60. Evaluation of potential cardiac transplant recipient. The complexity of the recipient evaluation uh, uh, mandates a term approach. The initial ev uh, evaluation involved a comprehensive history and physical examination because this will help to determine the etiology and contraindication. Also hematological, uh, biochemical uh, analyze and some images. 
for the assessment of heart itself, in addition to routine 12 lead uh, ECG, Holter monitor, and echo, all patients should undergo cardiopulmonary exercise test to evaluate functional capacity if disease severity allowed. Peak exercise oxygen consumption measured during maximum exercise testing, VO2 max, provide a measure of functional capacity and cardiovascular reserve and an inverse relationship between VO2 max and mortality in heart failure patient has been demonstrated. Documentation of the adequate effort during exercise as evidenced by uh, attaining a respiratory uh, exchange ratio greater than one or achievement of the anaerobic threshold at 50 to 60% of VO2 max is necessary to avoid underestimation of the functional capacity. Right side heart catheterization should be performed at the transplanting center to evaluate the severity of the heart failure and evaluate for presence of the pulmonary hypertension. Also guide therapy while awaiting uh, for the transplantation. Coronary angiography should be reviewed to confirm improbability of the coronary artery lesion in case of the ischemic cardiomyopathy. As well as, uh, as well, either BET scan and xylem uh, redistribution study or cardiac MRI study should assess viability in selected patient who would be candidate for revascularization if sufficient viability is present. Biopsy should be performed uh, on all patients in whom the etiology of heart failure is questioned, especially those with non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, symptomatic for fewer than six months. The neuropsychiatric assessment should be performed for base, uh, persons experienced uh, uh, in evaluation cardiac patient uh, to determine if the organic brain dysfunction or psychiatric illness is present and exper uh, experienced a social worker should assess for presence of the adequate social and financial support. Uh, here, um, uh, the cardiac transplant evaluation tools regarding labs and uh, cardiac uh, uh, imaging and uh, lab-wise uh, and regarding vascular, uh, renal, pulmonary, GIT, and metabolic, neurological, psychiatric, dental, social, and transplant coordinator. Uh, regarding the indication of the cardiac transplantation, there, is a, uh, there are a predictor of the poor prognosis and potential indication for uh, transplantation, like a lower uh, ejection fraction less than 20, reduce uh, VO2 max less than uh, 14 ml, arrhythmias, um, high pulmonary capillary which pressure more than 25, elevated plasma nor adrenaline concentration more than 600, reduced serum sodium concentration less than 130, and more recently, uh, in terminal uh, propane uh, nitrate peptide more than 5,000. Uh, this is the summarization of the indication. Uh, started with systolic uh, heart uh, failure, as defined by reduced ejection fraction less than uh, 35. And the predictor of the poor prognosis if the ejection fraction less than 20, including criteria uh, ischemic or uh, dilated vascular or hypertension, excluded etiology um, in case of amyloid, HIV, and uh, cardiac sarcoma. Uh, also, ischemic heart disease with uh, intracardiac angina uh, with ineffective maximum tolerated medical therapy and not a candidate for direct myocardial revascularization, BCI, or transmyocardial revascularization procedure, or unsuccessful myocardial revascularization. Regarding intractable uh, intra, uh, 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 arrhythmia, which is uncontrolled by a pacing uh, defibrillator, and not amenable for electrophysiology study single or combined medical therapy, and not a candidate for uh, ablation therapy. Uh, heterotopic cardiomyopathy with the class uh, four symptoms persistent despite uh, therapy, which is uh, alcohol injection, uh, myotomy, mitral valve replacement, uh, maximum medical therapy, and pacemaker therapy. Congenital heart disease in which severe um, fixed pulmonary hypertension is not a complication 
and last, the cardiac tumor confirmed to the myocardium with no evidence of the distant disease revealed by the extensive metabolic workup. Um, regarding the contraindication of the cardiac transplantation, each transplant program varies regarding absolute criteria based on the clinical circumstance and experience. Started uh, with age is um, one of the most controversial criteria for the transplantation. The upper age limit for recipient is uh, center specific, but uh, patient phys uh, physiological uh, rather than chronological age is more important. The official adult uh, uh, heart transplant report in uh, 2009 from the registry of the International uh, Society of the Heart and Lung Transplant noted that the over last 25 years, the percentage of the recipient older than 60 years of age uh, increased uh, steady, up, uh, approaching 25 of all heart transplant between 2002 and 2008, compared with uh, just above 5% uh, between 1982 to 1988. Also, the elderly uh, have a greater potential for occult systemic disease. They, uh, that may, uh, may uh, com uh, complicate uh, their post-operative course. But some recent uh, reports suggested that morbidity and mortality in carefully selected older patients compared with the younger recipient have fewer rejection episodes than younger patients. Uh, the second contraindication uh, is a fixed pulmonary vascular resistance to more than uh, 60 units and trans pulmonary gradient more than 15 as uh, acceptable uh, absolute contraindication. In the preoperative evaluation of the transplant recipient, if the pulmonary hypertension is discovered, an assessment of the its reversibility should be performed in the cardiac catheterization. Sodium nitroprusside traditionally has been uh, used at starting dose of 0.5 mg per kg per minute and titrate by 5 mg per kg per minute until there is acceptable decline in the pulmonary vascular resistance. 2.5 uh, would units or at least by 15 uh, with maintenance of the adequate systolic, uh, systemic systolic blood pressure. If the sodium nitroprusside uh, failed, we can use other modality or other medication like adenosine, prostaglandin, melanin, or inhaled nitric oxide also may be used. Uh, some patient who doesn't respond acutely with a response to continuous um, response to uh, continue IV in tropic therapy and repeat catheterization can be performed after 48 to 72 hours. IV beta blocker, uh, beta type, natriuretic peptide, uh, like anisteretide, uh, has shown uh, some efficacy in uh, refractory pulmonary hypertension. Uh, recently, uh, VAD are playing an important role in the heart transplant candidates uh, with pulmonary hypertension. A period of the left ventricular assist device support may allow decrease in pulmonary hypertension secondary to unloading of the left ventricle. Uh, in the fixed pulmonary hypertension, uh, there is increased risk of the uh, right ventricular failure when the right ventricle of the allograft is unable to adopt the sufficient pulmonary hypertension in the immediate postoperative period. Over the years, survival, uh, several study found the pulmonary hypertension to have significant effort on post-transplant mortality you, uh, using various parameters, a threshold value and follow-up period. However, lack of the mortality difference between heart transplant between, uh, and the heart transplant between patient with or without uh, preoperative pulmonary hypertension ha has also been reported. Uh, regarding also contraindication, irreversible renal dysfunction, defined as uh, creatinine clearance of less than 50 ml per minute and serum creatinine concentration of greater than 2 mg per deciliter associated with increased risk of post-operative dialysis and decreased survival. Patient may be considered for combined uh, heart and lung transplants. Irreversible hepatic dysfunction, if transaminase levels are more than twice their normal uh, value and associated with coagula uh, coagulation abnormality, 
precutaneous liver biopsy should be performed to exclude primary liver disease. Should, be, uh, should not be confused with a chronic cardiac uh, hepatopathy, which is characterized by elevation uh, and the cholestatic parameter along with the little or no changes in transaminase and it uh, is potentially reversible after heart transplantation. Uh, transplantation with patient with the diabetic mellitus is only contraindication in the presence of a significant end organ damage um, like uh, complicated by diabetic uh, nephropathy, retinopathy, or neuropathy. Some uh, centers have uh, expanded their criteria successfully to include the patient with mild to moderate end organ damage. Active infection was a, a sound reason to delay transplant. Uh, up to 48% of the patient with implanted LFAD reported with evidence of the uh, infection. And uh, the treatment of the elephant infection uh, is the, the put the patient on the top of the list for urgent transplantation. Here, regarding the absolute contraindication, uh, the age, it's different from center to center and fixed pulmonary hypertension, as we said, uh, systemic illness so that will uh, limit the survival, like neoplasm, other than skin uh, center, uh, cancer, less than uh, five years, HIV systemic lupus erythromatous, any systemic uh, disease with high uh, probability of recurrence, and irreversible renal or uh, hepatic dysfunction. Uh, regarding a relative uh, potential relative contraindication, uh, recent malignancy, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, recent pulmonary infection with uh, pulmonary uh, embolism, diabetic mellitus with end organ uh, damage, peripheral vascular or uh, cerebrovascular disease, active peptic ulcer disease, current or recent diverticulitis, other systemic illness, uh, limited the survival or rehabilitation of the patient, severe obesity or cachexic, severe osteoporosis, uh, active alcohol or drug abuse, history of non-compliance or psychiatric illness, like to interfere with the long-term compliance and absent of the psycho uh, psychological support. Um, regarding pharmacological bridge to the transplantation, uh, critically compromised patients required uh, admission to ICU uh, for further management regarding anthropic therapy, arrhythmia management, fluid overload management, and optimized organ perfusion and nutritional supports. Uh, mechanical bridges, uh, bridge to the transplantation. Uh, placement of the intraaortic uh, balloon pump and necessary with patient with heart failure with refractory to initial pharmacological uh, major, uh, major, uh, measures. Uh, the landmark uh, of uh, randomized evaluation of the mechanical assessment uh, and the uh, treatment of the chronic heart uh, failure trial provide evidence uh, that LFAD support provide a statistic statistically uh, significant reduction in the risk of the death uh, from any cause when compared with the optimal medical uh, management uh, with the 30% difference. Uh, the total uh, artificial heart uh, positioned uh, uh, orthotopically uh, replaced both native uh, ventricles and or cardiac valve. And the potential advantage of this um, device is elimination of the or elimination of the problem commonly seen uh, in the bridges of the transplantation with left ventricular or biventricular assisting device such as right heart failure, valvular regurgitation, cardiac arrhythmia, ventricular clots, or intraventricular uh, communication and low blood flows. Uh, recipient uh, prioritization for transplantation. Based on the survival and the uh, quality of the life expected to be gained in the comparison with the maximum medical and survival uh, and surgical alternatives, this priority status is based on uh, recipient status level, uh, class 1A, uh, 1B, or 2, blood type, blood size, and uh, duration of the time are uh, uh, at the status level. Uh, here uh, we see the current recipient uh, status criteria. Uh, 
in the status uh, 1A, patient who required mechanical uh, circulatory assistance device with one or more of the following device, total artificial heart, lift and or heart ventricular assisted uh, device implanted for 30 days or less, intra-aortic balloon pump, uh, ECMO, uh, mechanical circulatory support for more than 30 days with significant uh, uh, device-related complication, patient on mechanical ventilation, continuous infusion of high dose of the uh, endotropes, and life expectancy without transplant is less than seven days. A status 1B, a patient who have at least one of the following device, a left or right ventricular assisting device implanted for more than three days um, and continuous infusion of the uh, IV endotropes. Uh, status uh, to all other waiting patients who doesn't me meet status of um, 1A or 1B uh, criteria. A uh, patient uh, considered for transplantation should be examined at least every three months for uh, re-evaluation of recipient status. Yearly uh, right side heart catheterization indicated for all candidates on the waiting list and in the selected cases for patient rejected because of the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, regarding donor selection, once uh, a branded individual has been identified as the potential cardiac donor, the patient undergoes rigorous uh, three-phase screening regimen. The primary screening is undertaken by the organ uh, procurement uh, ag um, agency. Information regarding patient age, height, and uh, weight, gender, blood grouping, hospital course, Cause of death and routine laboratory data include uh, cytomegalovirus, HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Uh, serology are co uh, collected. Cardiac surgeon uh, or cardiologist perform the secondary screening, which involved further investigation to determine contraindication uh, and uh, uh, hemodynamically support necessary to sustain the donor and review of the uh, uh, ECG and uh, arterial blood gases determination and echo. A coronary uh, and geography is indicated in the presence of the advanced donor age, traditionally for male donor more than 45 years of age and for female donor more than 50 years of age. History of, of cocaine use or of, uh, or the donor uh, has the three risk factor of the coronary artery disease, such as hypertension, diabetic smoking history, dyslipidemia, or family history, or premature coronary artery disease, also indication for coronary angiography. The final and uh, often most important screening of the donor occur intraoperatively at the time of the organ uh, recruitment by the cardiac surgical team. Direct visualization of the harm of the heart is performed by the evidence of the right ventricular or valvular dysfunction, previous uh, infarction, myocardial contusion, secondary to closed chest compression or blunt uh, chest trauma. The coronary ar uh, arterial tree is palpated uh, for cross calcification, indication of the atheromatous uh, disease. If direct examination of the heart is unremarkable, the recipient hospital is notified and the procurement surgeon proceed uh, with donor cardiotomy, uh, usually in co con conjunction uh, with the multi-organ procurement. Uh, this is the donor selection for heart transplantation, um, suggestive criteria for uh, cardiac donor and suggestive criteria and evaluation tools uh, for the donor. Expanded the donor criteria and alternate listing uh, being used by some uh, centers to match uh, certain uh, recipients who might be excluded from the standard list with marginal donor hearts that otherwise would go uh, unused. Expanded um, donor criteria uh, include uh, smaller than the recipient, uh, donor with the coronary artery disease, uh, that might require the uh, cabbage, uh, left ventricular dysfunction, or donors from uh, older age group. Management of the cardiac donor. Uh, 
medical management of the cardiac donor, uh, an integral part of the organ preservation, is complica uh, complicated uh, by the complex uh, physiological phenomena of the brain death and need uh, to the coordinate uh, with other organ donor teams. Brain death is associated with autonomic and cytokine storm. The release of the noradrenaline lead to the subendocardial ischemia. Subsequent cytokine, cytokines release result in the further myocardial depression. Cytokinase phenomena, vasodilatation and loss of the temperature control. Intense uh, autonomic activity is followed by loss of the sympathetic tone and massive reduction in the systemic vascular resistance. Overall, a brain stem death results in severe hemodynamically instability, the degree of which directly related to the severity of the brain injury and may result from the vasomotor autonomic dysfunction, hypovolemia, hypothermia, and dysarrhythmias. Fluid overload should be avoided uh, to prevent post-op uh, allograft dysfunction caused by the chamber distension and myocardial edema. The main arterial blood pressure should be uh, kept on 60 or more in the presence of the CVP of 6 to uh, 10. Normal temperature and electrolyte level acid base balance and oxygenated, um, oxygenation should be kept within normal range. Blood glucose at uh, 120 to uh, 180 milligram per, per deciliter. Uh, routine guidelines. Uh, uh, Additionally, uh, put a standardized uh, hormonal resuscitation package uh, consisting of uh, methylpredoncelone, 15 mg per kg colus, and uh, triothyronine, uh, 4 mg colus, followed by infusion of the 3 mg per hour, and arginine, uh, phasopressin, uh, 1 unit colus, followed by 0.5 to 4 units per hour to the standard donor management protocol and the uh, board uh, spectrum antibiotic with the cephalosporine is initiated followed uh, by the collection of the van uh, cultures. This is the allogram of the uh, recommended heart donor uh, management. Uh, donor recipient uh, matching regarding blood group uh, anti um, human leukocytic antigen antibody cross matching and patient size. A donor weight should be uh, within 30% of the recipient uh, weight. In case of the elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, larger donor is uh, preferred. Uh, Cross-matching, um, uh, anti-human uh, leukocytic antigen antibody. Patient with elevated level of the uh, binary active antibody to uh, human leukocytic antigen have a higher rate of the organ rejection and decreased uh, survival uh, than um, do patients without such antibody. Uh, before uh, proceeding with the transplantation, many medical centers uh, do uh, prospective uh, cross-matching either by um, cytometry or ELISA to determine whether a donor-specific antibody that threaten uh, the allograft are present. Uh, start now by um, donor heart uh, recruitment, started by median sternotomy, uh, pericardial is incised, a heart is inspected and palpated for any evidence of the cardiac disease or injury, and uh, communicated uh, of the finding to the transplant team. Superior vena cava and inferior vena cava and azygous vein are mobilized circumferentially and encircled with the ties. A word is dissected from the pulmonary artery and isolated with the tape to facilitate uh, to the pericardium by the liver recruitment team. The cardiac team then uh, retires uh, from the operating room table. Once in preparation uh, for uh, liver, pancreas, lung, and kidney ex uh, explantation is complete, a uh, heparin is given uh, IV. Uh, and the first uh, strength suture is placed in the ascending aorta and cardioplegic catheter is placed. The azygous vein and superior vena cava are doubly ligated and divided distal to the azygous vein, leaving a long segment of the superior vena cava. 
the IFC is incised and the left side fins uh, put either in the right atrial appendage or in the via transected pulmonary vein. The aorta cross clamp is applied at takeover of the nominate artery and the heart is arrested with the single flush um, 1000 uh, or uh, ml or 22 uh, 10 mil, uh, ml per kg of cardioplegia. Um, rapid cooling of the heart achieved by the um, uh, copious amount of the cold saline uh, into the pericardial wall. After the delivery of the cardioplegia, cardiotomy uh, proceeds uh, as the apex of the heart is uh, evalu uh, elevated and any uh, remaining uh, intact pulmonary veins are divided. Uh, this maneuver uh, modified appro uh, appropriately uh, to retain adequate left atrial cuff for both lung and heart if the lung also are uh, being uh, pro uh, procured. Uh, then the ascending aorta is transected proximally to the nominate artery and the, uh, and the pulmonary arteries are divided distal to the bifurcation. Uh, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava are transected, followed by a water and pulmonary artery. Left atrium divided as the last step. This allows for optimum diffusion of the left atrium, uh, particularly when the lung is uh, recovered. It's critically uh, important to avoid left ventricular dysfunction and uh, ensure uh, um, throw uh, cooling with isoline. A graft is examined for evidence of uh, patent foramen oval, which should be uh, closed at uh, that time. And if a abnormality identified and placed of the allograft in st a sterile container for transplant to the recipient uh, hospital. Organ uh, preservation. Current clinical graft preservation techniques generally permits a safe ischemic period of, six, uh, of four to six hours single flush of the cardioplegia or preservation solution followed by static hypothermic uh, strategy at uh, four to 10 degree is preferred uh, method by the most uh, transplant centers. Uh, here we have a picture of the organ uh, care um, system, uh, trans uh, medics. Uh, the heart is preferred and 34, uh, preserved in 34 uh, degree with the pulsatile uh, flow. In the monitor, we can see, um, look for uh, different blood pressure, uh, like uh, perfusion pressure, coronary pressure, uh, and aortic pressure. Or can also, uh, can check the lactate and other uh, parameter. Uh, from the disadvantage of uh, this device, it's uh, costly. And uh, here we can see uh, studies. It's uh, been studied in many uh, uh, study uh, approved that uh, efficacy. And uh, some clinical trial was uh, done uh, showed uh, non inferiority, and some uh, study showed the uh, lower episode of uh, rejection and regarding uh, acute renal failure and short hospital uh, stay. Uh, and uh, also it's a preferred method, uh, metabolic uh, effect also found uh, uh, in those patients. Uh, the main uh, advantage uh, of this uh, organ care uh, system is uh, expanded the ischemic uh, time. Uh, the longest study found uh, using this device uh, up to uh, 10 and a half uh, uh, hours, the heart is transplanted and the patient, uh, both the patient and the ECMO and uh, discharge uh, in, in good condition within 18 days. And now we go to the operation and preparation for the recipient, uh, started by the median sternotomy and pericardiotomy. A uh, patient is hibernized and prepared for cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, Award the cannula proximal to origin of the anominate artery by caval venous cannulation, and the uh, tapes near are passed through uh, around the superior and inferior vena cava. 
after uh, the donor heart has arrived, bypass initiated, and patient called uh, to degree 28, cables near are uh, uh, tightened, uh, ascending aorta is cross clamped, uh, aorta and main pulmonary artery uh, transected above semilunar valves, atria are incised uh, along the atrioventricular grooves, leaving a cuff for allograft uh, implantation. Proximal aorta and pulmonary artery separated from the uh, other uh, by the electrocutary uh, care to, to not uh, injure the right pulmonary vein. Continuous uh, aspiration of the pulmonary venous retained from the bronchial collaterals achieved by insertion of the vent in the uh, left atrial, uh, either directly or in the right superior pulmonary vein. Timing uh, of the donor and recipient uh, cardiotomies is uh, critical to minimize allograft ischemic time and recipient bypass time. Frequent communication between the procurement and transplant team permits optimum uh, coordination of the procedure. The recipient cardiotomy is completed just uh, before the arrival of the cardiac allograft. Uh, the second part of the after preparation is implantation. The donor heart is removed from transplant collar and placed in a basin of cold saline. If not uh, previously performed, preparation of the donor heart is accomplished. Sharp dissection uh, to separate the aorta from the pulmonary artery. Left atrial cuff is incised by connecting to the pulmonary vein orifice. The cuff is uh, tailored uh, to the size of the recipient's left atrium. And uh, this is the preparation of the allograft heart transplantation and the uh, pulmonary vein uh, joined to the uh, left uh, atrial cuff. Uh, implantation uh, begins with the placement of double armed uh, 3 o proline suture through the recipient's left atrial uh, cuff at the level of the left superior pulmonary vein and then through the donor left atrial cuff near from the base of the atrial appendage, like we see here in the picture. Uh, allograft is lowered into the recipient mediastinal and uh, the suture continued in a uh, running manner caudally and medially to the inferior aspect of the interatrial septum. Uh, the second arm of the suture is run along the roof of the left atrium and down to the intra, uh, intraatrial septum. Any size discrepancy should be assessed and corrected. Left atrium is filled with saline and the two arm of the suture tied uh, together uh, on the outside of the heart. A must center use uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, into uh, insufflation uh, in the field. Uh, left atrial anastomosis is uh, completed. Uh, then go to the right atrial anastomosis uh, in running fashion, similar to the left atrial with the initial anchor suture placed either at the most superior or inferior aspect of interatrial septum so that uh, the end of the suture uh, will meet each other in the middle of the anterolateral wall. Uh, next, the end-to-end -end superior vena cava anastomosis is uh, constructed uh, using 5O proline stitch. You can look uh, to the posterior road of the anastomosis uh, to minimize the risk of the burst strength. End-to-end uh, -end pulmonary artery anastomosis is performed using 4O uh, uh, proline stitch, beginning with the posterior wall from inside of the fissures and then comple uh, complete uh, the anterior wall from outside. Uh, the pulmonary artery uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, crucial uh, that the pulmonary artery end uh, be uh, terminated uh, to eliminate any redundancy in the fissures that might cause uh, kinking. Uh, rewarming uh, at this time, then as a final step, end to end our anastomosis performed similar manner, except uh, some redundancy uh, is uh, needed uh, because it's facilitated visualization of the uh, posterior suture, uh, suture line. 
روتين دي ايرنج تكنيك اور ذا كروس كلامب از ريموفد هاف اوف بيشنت ريكوايرد الكتريكال دي فايبروليشن نيدل فنت انسرتد ان ذا اسينتينج اورتا فور ذا فاينل دي ايرنج بوت ذا بيشنت ان ستيب ترندلينج بيرك بوزيشن السيوتر لاين از انسبكتد كيرفولي فور هيموستيزيس Uh, infusion of the inotropes and temporarily base my uh, basing uh, may be required. Uh, patient is weaned from the cardiopulmonary bypass and cannula uh, are removed. Temporarily, epicardial basing wire are placed in the donor right atrium and ventricle. Insertion of the mediastinal, uh, mediastinal and pleural tube, median sternotomy closed in the standard fashion. Uh, the cardiac surgeon uh, should work closely with anesthetologist uh, to ensure that all metabolic measurements uh, corrected like hyperglycemia, hyper or hypokalemia, respiratory or metabolic acidosis, and um, hypocalcemia. Volume resuscitation should be closed, closely monitoring, especially when the blood products are required to correct uh, the coagulation. Uh, here... Um, we can uh, see regarding uh, the result uh, the uh, divided uh, by uh, a new uh, uh, aura uh, we can see 50% uh, of the patient survival up to uh, uh, 12 and a half uh, year and uh, recently from 2010 to 2017 uh, we see the ad advancement in um, better outcome uh, 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 attribute to advancement in the uh, autoimmune and the better selection of the patient uh, recipient donor and uh, bridging. Uh, we see down the median uh, survival increase by uh, aura from 8.6 until uh, reaching 12.5. Uh, uh, lastly, and uh, regarding uh, the results, uh, the cause of the uh, death uh, post-op uh, is divided by the uh, period. Uh, first, start by uh, early 30 days uh, post-op until reaching 15 uh, years. Uh, we can see in 30 uh, days on top of the list, uh, the graft uh, failure. Uh, second, uh, in 31 days, we see the infection. And uh, after that coming the multi-organ failure, uh, renal uh, failure and uh, multi-organ failure. Thank you. Any question or comments? السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام. Um, so for uh, sorry, غادة for this uh, presentation, um, uh, uh, may I just uh, out of ignorance, which level are you? R R four. R four. Yeah, there is definitely any room for improvement of the presentation and how to. Uh, improve your presentation, um, making it more like at attractive and not just reading through the slides and maybe enriching the slides with, with the graphs and with the, with the um, uh, illustrations. Um, I, wanna, I wanna ask you, um, I, I know most of this, يعني, it's a, a lot of knowledge that you have tried to squeeze in, in, uh, in the short time, but, um, so some of the issues that you have mentioned, some of the technical things that you have mentioned, maybe better grasp with uh, uh, spending some time with the team, with the transplant team. So have you have you seen any transplant uh, so far? Uh, only once when I'm on R1. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. For those who are interested, you may want to choose one of those centers that do 
um, quite a bit of heart transplant in the kingdom and spend maybe a month or two as part of your uh, senior rotations. It will definitely enrich your uh, knowledge. Uh, there is um, a transplant team that meet uh, regularly every week, and they discuss uh, different aspects, just like the one you mentioned. And those are really, um, um, it engraves your, 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 the knowledge that you require um, uh, to, ac to acquire, at least uh, for, for this practice. Um, it's definitely, heart failure surgery is definitely one of the uh, aspects that you may want to consider for your future. And this is for everybody. Uh, what do, why do we use uh, CO2 on the field um, in some of the cases like heart transplant or some valve surgery? or things like this, uh, Ada? Uh, for uh, de-airing purpose. Okay, do you know the, uh, so when you say de-airing, you mean even if you have an air uh, bubble in the circulation, mm -hmm. it will be CO2, and therefore it will reduce the instance of uh, CVA. Uh, how much time does it take to resolve the uh, bubble of CO2 compared to bubble of uh, air? Yeah. I don't have any idea. Okay, so there is basic science uh, principles in, the, in relation to this that you may want to uh, grasp. I asked the question if there is a consultant on the uh, case, but it's always good for any presenter uh, to consult with one of the colleagues. Um, there are many with uh, interest in, the, in different subjects and they can help you with the discussion point and the raising the question or even design the presentation. Um, thank you very much, Elida, and uh, I'm out. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum. So apparently none of the panelists assigned for today are around. So we resume the next session by two o'clock.
Assalamu alaikum. Um, do we have Dr. Mustafa? Okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start for time's sake. Today I'll be discussing complications of cardiac transplant, immunology, and drugs. So uh, immunologic basis of heart transplantation, major histocompatibility complex uh, are actually proteins that vary between individuals um, and uh, they allow the immune system to distinguish cell from non-self. They're also known as the hemolecocyte antigens because they're expressed at high levels on leukocyte expressed uh, on leukocytes on the surface of uh, almost every uh, single cell in the human body. So if they're recognized by an organ recipient, they can trigger um, our recognition uh, rejection. The major histocompatibility complex is divided into three regions or classes, uh, one, two, and three. The main one that is um, abbreviated on the endothelium and parenchymal cells in association with inflammation uh, is class one. Um, T cells are the primary immune actors in the pathologic reaction to transplanted organs. They participate in cytotoxicity and cytokine-mediated inflammation, and they're actually the, the primary um, immune cell um, that is targeted in immune suppression therapy post-transplant. For the immune suppressive modalities in transplantation, they reduce the intensity of immune response to a degree that allows the acceptance of the allograft, but yet uh, provides sufficiently low toxicity to permit prolonged survival. So that's the whole concept of immune suppression. Um, so we'll discuss three uh, situations requiring combination of immune suppressive therapies. The first is induction therapy, which uh, happens inside the OR before, uh, after CPP. Um, this includes high dose immune suppression to facilitate graft acceptance and minimize the chance of early rejection. The second is maintenance therapy for chronic acceptance of the allograft that is lifelong um, after transplantation. And the third is augmented immune suppression, which only reserved, which is reserved uh, to um, reverse episodes of acute rejection. So starting with induction therapy, generally it, it includes one of two approaches. First, the anti-CD25, which is uh, dexlizumab or bisliximab, and the second um, option is the antithymocyte globulin or anti-CD3. For the anti-CD3, OKT3, currently not in use due to the uh, toxicity rate and side effects. So for bisliximab and uh, dexlizumab, they are mainly used uh, for induction therapy and uh, they are monoclonal anti-CD25 antibody against the interleukin-2 receptor on T lymphocytes. It doesn't usually require monitoring, and um, there aren't any serious adverse effects um, or reactions reported. In heart transplant recipients, induction immune suppression with dexlizumab was associated with reduced frequency of cardiac allograft rejection and a lower incidence of cardiac allograft vasculopathy at one year, but in a randomized trial, it was associated with higher one-year mortality due to increased deaths related to infections. 
So for the anti-CD3, we mentioned that it's not currently used uh, because of the side effects associated with cytokine release syndrome, nephrotoxicity, increased susceptibility to infections, and post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. For the anti-thymocytic globulin, they're used uh, for induction. They're also used for steroid resistant and recurrent rejection and rejection with hemodynamic compromise. The mechanism, well, it's a polyclonal anti T cell antibody preparation. It inhibits the TCR antigenic peptide interaction, and that destroys the entire signal to uh, activate T lymphocytes. It doesn't require monitoring, but some centers measure the T cell count. Um, some of the adverse inf uh, effects include thrombocytopenia, arthralgia, edema, fever, chills. Uh, some rare major systemic reactions include hypotension, aphlaxis, respiratory distress, and serum sickness. Moving on to the maintenance immune suppression generally includes immune suppressive agents from three general classes, or also called the triple drug therapy or strategy. So the first is the calcineurin inhibitor with their cyclosporin or tacrolimus. And the second is anti-proliferative drugs like MMF, azathioprine, methotrexate, uh, cyclophosphamide, or serolimus. Now, most of the times they use only one antiproliferative with one calcineur inhibitor and in combination with steroids, but sometimes they may combine to antiproliferative drugs. Um, anyways, the ideal regimen and dosage um, is controversial and it depends on the center, it depends on the uh, multidisciplinary approach, and uh, depends on the patient's factors. So for the calcineur inhibitors, um, the Okay, the mechanism is uh, T cell receptor activation by peptide MHC complexes lead to increased intracellular calcium levels in the activated T cell. Now, this increased intracellular calcium binds to the calcium neuron, and that starts the whole um, uh, activation of the uh, leading to T cell proliferation through the M fat, allowing migration to the nucleus, um, etc. So, blocking the calcium neuron disrupts this entire signal. Um, so first we have the tacrolimus. It requires close monitoring of renal profile because it's uh, nephrotoxicity, but it's also associated with other side effects like neurotoxicity, glucose intolerance, hyperkalemia. Cyclosporins like neural and Gingraf and Sandal and Sandy immune, they have many drug-drug interactions um, and they're associated with worse side effects compared to tacrolimus. So some of the drug uh, interactions with cyclosporin include um, those that decrease metabolism by competing for cytochrome P450 system like erythromycin and ketoconazole and diltiazem, verapamil, some that increase the bioavailability by increasing the GI absorption like meticlobramide, and some decrease the cyclosporin blood concentration like uh, rifampin, isonazide. Uh, the list goes on actually, it's a very, very long list. Now the thing is between tacrolimus and cyclosporin, uh, both of them have side effects um, that are similar to some extent. Um, however, tacrolimus is associated with uh, less hypertension and hypercholesterolemia, but more frequently neurotoxicity and diabetes. So both undergo the cytochrome P450, both have drug-drug interactions, both have similar side effects, but tacrolimus um, seems to be favored because of the hypertension, hypercholesterolemia um, uh, side effects that are being less. Now moving on to, to the anti-proliferative drugs, which are mainly azathioprine or MMF. So for azathioprine, it's the first one that was utilized and um, it's a, basically an imatazole derivative of 6 mercaptive urine. But um, now they're using uh, mainly MMFs, which inhibit the, the inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase, which result in selective decrease in TMB cell proliferation. So because of the significant side effect profile, azathioprine has been largely replaced by MMF. Um, in heart transplant patients, a large randomized multi-center trial demonstrated decrease in one-year mortality and decreased rejection uh, associated with MMF compared with azathioprine in a platform of, uh, of course, using uh, the, the, the remaining of the triple therapy, a cyclosporin or uh, some other uh, calcineur inhibitor plus steroids. We also have mTOR inhibitors, um, which are serolimus and ivrolimus. They're basically anti-proliferative agents that bind to the intracellular amino, uh, aminophilin FK506 binding routine. They target rapamycin and uh, that halts the progression of the cell cycle and decrease the T cell proliferation activation. 
In heart transplant recipients, sirolimus and ebrolimus have been shown to reduce the allograft rejection and decrease the incidence of severity of CAV, which we will discuss later. Um, however, heart transplant patients treated with mTOR inhibitors have more renal dysfunction and increased incidence of bacterial infections. Now the last, the last um, uh, drug in the triple therapy steroids, um, they maintain, it's used for maintenance of uh, immune suppression and it's used for pulse therapy for acute rejection. The mechanism, will it inhibits various cytokines, uh, most importantly, interleukin-2 reduction, and that would impair the T cell activation and proliferation. It's associated with a lot of side effects that I'm not gonna bore you with, but um, it includes cushionoid uh, features, uh, myopathy, osteoporosis, uh, fluid retention, hypertension. Before I move on to the complications of uh, transplant, I'd like to discuss the hemodynamics expected post-op um, to better understand the complicate, some of the complications. So um, the donor preservation results in a transient myocardial depression, which requires support with inotropes and pressor agents uh, post, uh, early on post-transplant. The donor heart lacks sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves of the autonomic nervous system. So the intrinsic heart rate is typically between 90 to 110, and uh, it's dependent on circulating catecholamines rather than the direct innervation in, uh, in normal situation. So uh, this results in delayed response to stress and lack of reflux tachycardia. The elevated heart rate also serves to reduce the diastolic volume, uh, which should be maintained with chronotropic agent or epicardial basing wires to reduce likely the likelihood of uh, RV failure. <clears throat> Now for donor allograft preservation, um, it, also, it also has to do with the reduction in contractility and diastolic dysfunction and newly transplanted hearts typically require inotropic support for several days. Uh, sometimes they use beta agonist for uh, the first uh, week after transplant, depending on the graft um, function before weaning to ensure adequate restoration of uh, myocardial function. So we'll start with this uh, slide. I think uh, my colleague previously, she, she discussed it as well, but uh, basically it demonstrates the causes, the most common causes of death uh, post-transplant. And, and as you can see, within the first month uh, post-transplant, the graft failure uh, is leading. Um, however, after that, up to one year, the most common cause of death would be infections. Um, after between one to five years, um, the graft failure leads again. And uh, beyond five years, usually the most common cause of death is um, malignancy followed by graft failure and uh, followed by cow. So we'll discuss graft dysfunction first. So, so most cases are mild and they resolve with supportive care only. 10 to 15%, however, progress to primary graft failure and that would require inotropic support, plus minus circulatory mechanical support, or even uh, retransplant. Primary graft dysfunction is defined as severe ventricular dysfunction of donor graft, which uh, fails to meet the circulatory requirements of the recipient in the immediate post-transplant period. It may manifest as either single or biventricular dysfunction with low cardiac output and hypotension despite adequate filling pressures. So the incidence range um, here is uh, estimated to be between 2.3 to 28.2%. Uh, mortality varies by the cause of uh, end-stage heart disease with congenital heart disease uh, and valvular cardiomyopathy having the highest 30-day mortality rate. Now for the diagnosis, it's made within 24 hours post-transplant and it's, uh, it could be classified into LV primary graft dysfunction, RV prim uh, primary graft dysfunction, or biventricular. The pathogenesis is not completely understood. However, we link it to some risk factors, including mismatch, including ischemia, prolonged ischemia time, high transfusion requirements. Um, in the presence of risk factors, what we can do is assess the radio score or check the radio score, uh, which is a valid uh, scoring system to assess risk of primary graft uh, dysfunction. So for LV primary graft dysfunction, um, it could be mild, moderate, or severe, depending on the um, echo findings. So for ejection fraction less than 40% on echo or right atrial pressure more uh, than 15, 
uh, with rising more than 20 cardiac index less than two, uh, requiring low dose inotropes that would be labeled as mild LV primary graft dysfunction. Now, when we have a, an ejection fraction less than 40, a MAP, um, and also rising uh, right-sided pressure, which pressure uh, low cardiac index less than two, and MAP less than 70, that would be considered moderate. Now, if we require um, some sort of uh, circulatory support or intra-aortic balloon pump, high-dose inotropes, then this could be labeled as severe LV fibrograph dysfunction. Now, for the RV primary graft dysfunction, we don't have a scale for severity. However, um, usually they have right atrial pressures uh, above 15, which less than 15, um, they may require um, RVAD as well. So this is the radial score. And as you can see, they're assessing right atrial pressure. They check age, di presence of diabetes, uh, inotropic support dependence the age of the donor and the length of ischemia time. And um, these are the scores. So between zero to one, they have 8.3% risk of incidence and uh, for two, 11% risk and uh, score three, 24, and it goes on. It starts, it starts increasing the more, the higher score you have. Um, in this slide, we can appreciate that. So the, the grayish one represents the actual um, primary graft uh, failure while the black um, rep represents the predicted. And um, so you can see that the radial score, when you increase um, in the score, you will have obviously increased um, in the um, actual primary graft dysfunction. But uh, beyond five, the, um, the, uh, the actual patients will be actually um, over-predicted, <laughs> over -predicted with 33% of actual primary graft dysfunction or failure compared to 44. Moving on to secondary graft dysfunction, which is basically any, any allograft dysfunction that is identified to be the reason behind the hemodynamic instability and uh, LV uh, dysfunction. So such case uh, causes can include hyperacute rejection, pulmonary hypertension, or recognized intraoperative complication. We'll move on to cardiac arrhythmias. Um, most transplant recipients will have um, temporary AV pacing, of course. Now, some of the suggested um, mechanisms or uh, pathological pathways of how cardiac arrhythmias develop include surgical trauma, ischemia, reperfusion injury, and denervation. The incidence is reduced with bicaval anastomosis. Uh, it was also suggested that the incidence is increased with prolonged organ ischemia, nodal artery abnormality, uh, by atrial anastomosis, as an opposed to uh, by cable, preoperative use of amiodarone. For prognosis, sinus node typically recovers, and a permanent base maker is not necessary. AFib, a flutter, and other SV arrhythmias have been reported to uh, in five to thirty percent of patients after a heart transplant. Individual assessment of the risk benefit ratio for anticoagulation is necessary. Recurrent arrhythmias from re-entry circus um, or defined ectopic foci often can be cured by radiofrequency ablation. However, I'm not aware of any percentage of people after transplant who undergo radiofrequency ablation. Uh, but yeah, most of them, they have a base maker, temporary. Uh, SVTs and transplant patients should be treated in the same manner as in a non-transplant patients, but with lower doses. Sustained VT and ventricular fibrillation presumably are responsible for a significant portion of the 10% sudden unexplained deaths in heart transplant patients. Uh, preoperatively, many transplant recipients have some degree of impaired renal function, secondary so to the heart failure. Um, there is a worsening renal function preoperative, perioperatively. Risk is uh, compounded by the fact that the major immune suppressive agents um, are nephrotoxic. Induction therapy should be considered for patients who uh, are at risk of uh, perioperative renal dysfunction as a mean to delay calcineurin therapy. Interleukin 2 receptor blocker like uh, basiximab, uh, basiximab or simulacet or thymoglobulin 
remain in the mainstay for induction therapy as OTT3 have high risk profile. Again, we already discussed this point. Hyperacute rejection mediated by pre-existing antibodies to allogenic antigen, and they occur immediately after transplantation with rapid graft failure. It's uh, not, uh, it's uncommon because of the current blood and antigen typing techniques. Uh, treatment immediate plasmapheresis, IVG, IVIG, and mechanical support. For acute rejection, it can be subdivided into cellular or antibody mediated, and it accounts for 8% of deaths after a heart transplant. The incidence of any rejection has continued to decrease in the past uh, decade, and that's because of the improvement in immune suppression therapy and um, um, improved detection uh, modalities. So for the RV endomyocardial biopsy, it, it remains the gold standard for the diagnosis of acute rejection. It needs to be done routinely um, as the patients, most of them will be asymptomatic. Um, okay. So we have this table about the acute cellular rejection grades, basically grade zero, no histological evidence of rejection from the biopsy. Grade one, you will have some interstitial uh, and perivascular infiltration with up to one focus of myocyte damage. In grade two, you have two or more foci infiltration associated with myocyte damage. And grade three, you have diffuse multifocal myocyte damage, edema, hemorrhage, and vasculitis. The treatment depends whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, for symptomatic patients, all of them, regardless of the grade, uh, they need to be treated with high dose steroids. If hemodynamically uh, compromised, then, and if they're resistant to steroids within the first 24 hours, then the second line would be antithymocyte antibodies. For asymptomatic patients, however, um, we check the grade. So if it's mild, usually not treated, just um, repeat the endomyocardial biopsy and continue to monitor. For severe rejection, uh, you need to treat it as it's, um, 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 it's, um, it's dangerous for the patient's sur the allograft survival. And um, for the moderate asymptomatic, usually it's controversial. So it requires consideration of multiple variables of the patient, the medication, the, the team approach, However, what they agree on is that a follow-up biopsy should be performed every week or every two weeks after treatment for symptomatic and after or every two to four weeks after asymptomatic acute cellular rejection. Moving on to antibody-mediated rejection. So this is mediated by the humoral limb of the immune response. And unlike acute cellular rejection, Hemodynamic instability requiring inotropic support is common here. Um, asymptomatic uh, AMR um, has high incidence in the first year, high recurrence rate once it occurs. Risk factors are usually uh, include the female gender, patient with retransplant, cytomegalovirus uh, seropositivity, um, briar mechanical circuitry support, allosensitization against anti-HLA antibodies. Despite intervention, symptomatic AMR is associated with high mortality rate. Repeated episodes of AMR are highly associated with allograft coronary artery disease. Diagnosis requires evidence of endothelial cell swelling on light microscopy and immunoglobulin complement deposition by immune fluorescence techniques. The treatment includes plasmapheresis, high-dose steroids, heparin, IgG, and uh, cyclophosphamide. Moving on to the infections. So um, infections are induced by immune suppression. It's sort of expected. They need to have inf infection episodes uh, at some point. And most commonly, um, or most common cause of mortality between the one to five years post cardiac transplant is actually infections. Uh, upper and lower RT respiratory tract infections are common and they are important predictors of mortality within the first six months post transplant. Uh, because native agents are usually opportunistic, 
in 60% and nosocomial in 25%. Uh, the thing here is that patient may, may present with atypical presentation. Uh, so because they're on immune suppression, they may not have any spikes of fever, no leukocytosis. Most common or most frequently identified microorganisms are cytomegalovirus, aspergillus species, and nomocytosis germs. The described overall mortality rate is 30%, and the presence of bilateral pulmonary infiltration uh, with aspergillus infection is uh, independent risk factors of poor prognosis. Bacterial uh, uh, septicemia being the predominant infection, uh, infectious complications are closely linked to other post-transplant adverse events. So malignancy is associated with ABV and allograft vasculopathy is closely uh, associated with CMV. So this slide demonstrates the, the most common um, involved pathogens and infections. Bacterial are usually expected within the first month post-transplant, but then uh, viral infections dominate. Cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So Cardiac allograft vasculopathy calf is a progressive vascular occlusive disease affecting the coronary vessels of a cardiac allograft after transplant, and it remains an important morbidity after transplant. It resembles the atherosclerosis, except that the entomal proliferation is um, concentric rather than eccentric in atherosclerosis. Uh, calcifications uh, uncommon and elastic lamina remains intact. So the incidence is around 7.8% at one year, but then rises to nearly 50% at 10 years. Risk factors include male gender ischemic cardiomyopathy prior transplant and retransplant. Uh, what's important with CAV is that stats and medications uh, actually decrease the incidence um, and improve the survival um, in transplant patients. Standard triple drug immune suppressive regimens do not reduce the incidence of uh, calf coronary artery vasculopathy. But proliferation signal um, inhibitors, such as Everolimus and Serolimus, um, if you recall early on in the presentation, we, we mentioned that it reduces the incidence and severity uh, of calf, um, thereby allowing its progression. So we have this table demonstrating the grades. Um, basically the thing we look at, it depends on angiograph and it depends on lift main involvement. Uh, CAV zero is uh, not significant. Um, CAV one means um, it is a, there's mild disease with lift main um, lesion less than 50% or primary vessel with lesion less than 70% or branch stenosis less than 70. Uh, without allograft dysfunction. In uh, CAF2, it's considered moderate, and usually the left main would be involved in more or equal to 50%, or there's a primary vessel with lesion more than 70%, uh, or branch stenosis more than 70 in branches of two systems without allograft dysfunction. Now, in severe, you need to have allograft dysfunction, and um, regardless of the involvement. Um, but usually left main more than 50%, um, and primary vessels more than seven, or primary vessels more than 70, or branch stenosis more than 70 in all three branch systems with ejection fraction less than 45. So, because of the denervation of the allograft, um, cardiac, uh, cardiac allograft vasculopathy is usually asymptomatic just like any other uh, post-transplant uh, disease. And it provides, to provide early diagnosis, post-transplant patients undergo screening with angio starting at the first year post-transplant and annually or biannually thereafter, depending on their risk factors. Now for the treatment, once uh, we diagnose uh, CAF, it's, um, uh, to be honest, you're just gonna continue using statins. Um, and provide hemodynamic support, whether it's inotropes or mechanical circuitry support. You can modify immune suppression regimens, but that doesn't mean uh, it would improve the survival. 
Um, you can try BCI or Cabbage, but it doesn't have any role. And I don't think it's uh, being practiced because it doesn't influ uh, influence the survival rate. Now, moving on to malignancy, it's the most common cause of death after five years of transplant and up to 28% of patients will have malignancy by year 10 after transplant. Uh, the most common malignancies are skin, accounting for 18% of malignancies. Um, and neoplastic disorders after cardiac transplantation arise from three major causes. So it's either a pre-existing malignancies or transmission of malignancy from donor to recipient. The, both of these um, uh, causes are considered um, not rare, but not, not the most common. Most commonly, it's a de novo malignancy arising from uh, arising uh, after transplantation, and that's um, secondary to immune suppression. Systemic hypertension should be treated to prevent unnecessary afterload stress on the allograft. Um, in early post-op period, usually they start IV sodium nitroprusside or nitroglycerin um, to, to reduce or control the afterload and um, the stress on the allograft. Uh, Nicardipine infusion has been also reported to control post-op hypertension more rapidly um, and was superior to sodium nitroprusside in maintaining LV performance. Um, 12.7% of patients post-transplant will develop uh, sudden cardiac uh, death. The major causes were uh, presumed to be arrhythmia, cardiac arrest, myocardial infarction, uh, PE, or rejection. Now, majority are your males, 78% of them, and um, have both re-transplant hypertension and, um, and or uh, pre-transplant coronary artery disease. Um, also, I think um, my colleague previously described uh, the changes here you can see or the survival and outcomes post-transplant. Basically, the, the, the take-home message from the slide is that the survival rate is increasing over time as there's more advances in uh, immune suppression and uh, patient care. So from 8.6 years in the 90s to 12.5 years um, in 2009. The important points that um, I want to emphasize on late mortality, five to 10 years um, is expected post-transplant uh, associated with elevated BMI, diabetes, comorbidities in general. Mortality following transplant is usually secondary to primary graft failure within the first 30 days and then opportunistic infections um, within six months, and then acute allograft rejection first three years, and cardiac allograft vasculopathy or malignancy later after five years. The management of primary graft dysfunction is mostly supportive, but if needed, early mechanical circuitry support may be considered to improve survival. Those were the references. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please ask. Do you guys have any questions? Okay. Um, Dr. Farid, do we have Dr. Farid? Or Dr. Ahmed? Yes. Fadal, Dr. Do you have any comments? Uh, did you say uh, Dr. Ahmed is with us? I'm not quite sure if he managed to join. Uh, he was supposed to, but. Okay. I don't Well, see um, the, the complications of uh, heart transplant is. Uh, is an important topic, especially if you're working in an area where you, they do practice um, heart transplant. One of the most important things to remember, and this is for each one of us, is that anytime a transplant patient present to the ER for any reason, you have to think that this patient have um, rejection, some sort of rejection until proven otherwise. Um, early on, just like you mentioned, the infection rate is, uh, is probably the, the most important thing, and that's why we are have a stringent screening uh, criteria. Uh, sensitization is an important uh, topic, and that's what, maybe why the, uh, some of the females have higher rejection rate. Maybe it's related to the sensitization, uh, pregnancies, and uh, blood transfusion. 
Um, but there is also a protocol for that uh, that will help us uh, trans, uh, transplant some of those patients. And he did uh, allude to the use of uh, assist devices to help bring some patients down to a, a reasonable uh, risk. But at the same time, it will increase the rejection rate because of this uh, transfusion blood uh, usage for those patients. Um, you, you were with us in that paper, right? The one with the transplant, the, uh, the one that has some uh, um, hypertensive crisis um, due to um, uh, the uh, immune suppression me medication. Were you uh, part of the team? Um, no, it was a different one, different. Okay. Well, anyway, it's something to keep in mind. The complication from the medication sometimes may push you to have uh, use less medication or um, use a combination of uh, different medications to lessen the rejection from one point and to lessen the, uh, the complications from those medications. And it's very important to know those uh, uh, pharmaco um, related pharmacy related uh, medications. Uh, sorry, complications. Okay, thank you. Thank you, doctor. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, Nora. So, unfortunately, Dr. Simon will not be able to join before 3.30. So, we'll stop here and rejoin here at 3.30. We can't hear you at all. Hi, can you say your announcement again? Can, can you hear me now? Hello. Hello. Yeah, I think that's uh, Dr. Simon will not be able to join uh, until 3.30. So we'll stop here and at 3.30 with the third session. Okay, okay. Um, Luai, I sent uh, some notification about um, journal clubs, um, international journal club. Have you, you all received those? Is it in the group? You mean? The yeah, I put it in, in, in yeah, our group. In group. Yeah, group. It's, um, yeah, it's for congenital heart disease as well as for adult uh, heart disease. And it's um, sponsored by AATS. Uh, I think it will be wonderful if you all can join uh, those journal clubs. Um, I think it will be on a weekly basis. Uh, I can't remember the exact date. Uh, um, maybe the 13th Let's of uh, that will be first Wednesday of each month. Okay. So uh, if it's different topic like uh, adult cardiology, uh, sorry, adult cardiac surgery. And then the other one will be congenital. And the third one will be, um, uh, I think it will be a thoracic. It's, it will be interesting to find out how different people are thinking and maybe it will shape some of our uh, directions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. All right, see you at 313, Sean.
Hello, Dr. Simon. You can uh, uh, share your slides if you like. Hello? Yes, we can hear it, Dr. Simon. Oh, we can hear me. Okay, now let me see how this works here. Um, all right. Um, So good afternoon. I think, let me just get this. I need to share my screen, correct? I'm not the expert at Zoom. I've hardly used it, so. Um, you've already heard about uh, cardiac transplantation and uh, complications, correct? Yes, Dr. Simon, correct. Okay, so let me see here, share screen, Donk. Ah, one second. Almost there. Almost there. So I will give, I'll talk a bit about heart-lung transplantation. Um, I hope I will not disappoint you because it is uh, not necessarily the most exciting topic when it comes to giving presentations, but we shall see. Um, so I hope that you'll get something out of it. Can you see my screen? Yes, that's your sign. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about heart lung transplantation. Um, um, and I uh, hope that I will give you a bit of an overview. Now, I don't know how much uh, you know about the history of transplantation, but okay, I'll start. Oh. I'll start right at the beginning, which should be, oh, I need to do this, okay. So uh, the first recorded history will be very short. Transplantation actually in the history. Um, does anybody know who this is? Any ideas? Anyone? Yes, you can hear it, Dr. Simon. Yeah, does, anybody, does anybody have an idea who this is here on the picture? Who is that? What? Who is this on the picture? There. Uh, this okay. uh, <laughs> no idea. Anyone? Okay, I'll, lift, I'll let you in on in, in, the secret. This is Ganesha. It's an Indian god uh, with an elephant head. And the story uh, is the first recorded transplantation in the universe, um, Ganesha was a little boy um, and he was supposed to watch over Dashrati, who was the wife of Shiva. She wanted to take a bath and she wanted privacy. She said, check that no one comes into the bathroom. Her husband came home and Ganesha said, no, you can't go in. And the husband, Shiva, who's not very well known for being patient, was angry and chopped off his head. His wife was very angry about that. And so he said, yeah, I'll fix it. And he sent out his troops to bring them ahead because unfortunately the boy's head um, had been lost in the process. And they found an elephant. They decapitated the elephant and put the elephant's head onto the boy's body. And thus was the god Ganesha born. So that's the first one. It's quite a complex undertaking, xenotransplantation and head transplantation, both have not been successfully performed yet. When you look at the clinical history of transplantation, then basically, specifically for heart and lung transplantation, very important was 1907 Carell. And then it went, he, 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 he provided the technical basis and then it went on and on and on. Um, you don't really have to look at this. More interesting is the first heart transplantation uh, actually, and there's a picture missing here, I don't know why, uh, was recorded before 
Christ again in China, where somebody, a uh, very famous surgeon, exchanged the hearts between two soldiers for psychological disbalance. They needed medication. It was a complex operation. Interestingly, obviously, without the bypass machine. Um, and uh, the patients lived happily ever after. The first lung transplantation recorded was done in 1963. Um, they obtained the uh, uh, they obtained the uh, consent uh, of the hospital and the okay of the hospital to do a lung transplantation in 1963 in Miss, uh, at the University of Mississippi Hospital, and they did find a. A uh, recipient who at the time had neoplastic occlusion of the left main bronchus of lung cancer. Not an indication today, but they said, okay, this is an indication for pneumonectomy. They did find a donor on June 11th, 1963, um, and it was a non heart beating donor, interestingly enough. Um, and they did the first lung transplantation in 1963, pre uh, immunosuppression with psychosporin, obviously. Um, patients survived for 18 days. Second heart transplantation, I don't know what this is. This is not, if I do this, wait one second. Let, let me see whether this gets, I don't understand this here. This picture cannot be displayed. I don't know why it cannot be displayed. Um, suddenly when I share my screen, it does not display you the pictures. I am really sorry. Um, okay, we'll have to go like this. The second heart transplantation was done in 1967. And you know, that was done in South Africa. It was mainly due to uh, be wanting to be the first. The patient also survived for 18 days. The successful lung transplantation, first one was 1968, was a single lung transplantation. And the patient survived for 10 months. So until that time, nobody had ever tried to uh, transplant a heart lung block. At that time, experiments were going on, and uh, for heart lung blocks, interestingly enough, so they when they were transplanting those into animals, they created an ex situ perfusion model, whereas the heart would basically perfuse the lung and then itself, uh, thereby uh, oxygenating itself. Um, and that concept obviously is slowly being reintroduced now with machines for heart and lung and already one heart lung has been transplanted like that. Yeah. Yeah. We can't see your slides, sir. You cannot. Uh, no, why can you not? I'm just share it again. Can you see it now? Yeah, now yes. it's appearing. Yeah, thank you. I don't know. It broke down. Uh, can you see this? Uh, see now it can't be presented. I don't know why. Anyways, so this one. So the first heart lung block, clinically, was transplanted in 1981 uh, by Bruce Wrights in Stanford. Um, that's where Shumway also did his work. Um, so it's. Of all the transplants in the cardiothoracic arena, it's obviously the youngest one. In the 80s, survival in lung transplantation was pretty much 50% in the operating theater and uh, on the intensive care unit. So this operation um, was not necessarily extremely successful. Um, then when you look at the indications from the beginning, until uh, 2018, this is the newest data that's available. Um, most patients who underwent lung transplantation had pulmonary artery hypertension as the underlying diagnosis, um, either as primary pulmonary hypertension, IPAH idiopathic, or as non-primary pulmonary artery hypertension. The cystic fibrotic patients, the COBD patients, all these other patients, as you can see, oh, they didn't make up a lot of patients anyways, but they are, um, they, they almost cease to exist for a variety of reasons. Now this operation in the beginning was not very successful, but uh, 
it became quite successful and it had um, quote unquote a great time, uh, but then went into decline. Um, the indication today, when you look at what, we're, what are we doing today in heart lung transplantation, then it's congenital heart disease. So these are patients with congenital heart defects that are not amenable to repair. And they can be of any age. So they could be uh, as early as less than one year um, and obviously older than 60. And then it's Eisenmenger syndrome, which is the irreversible pulmonary, so-called irreversible pulmonary artery hypertension. Many times in AV canal patients, TGAs, truncus, and others. And then it's acquired heart disease combined with pulmonary artery hypertension and or intrinsic lung disease. Um, and it's the normal pulmonary artery hypertension uh, or venoocclusive disease. So these are the main indications. And already you can see that uh, for many of these other options may become or may have become uh, available. Now, when you uh, look at how it developed, and then you can see that here in 1992, that was like the high times of heart lung transplantation. Um, this is worldwide. Um, a number, you know, 160 were done. In the year 2000 to 2010, uh, when I was, um, or from 1996 to 2010, 1998, sorry, 2010, when I was in Hanover, we were transplanting up to 30 heart lungs per year uh, in our best time. So it was, those, those were quote unquote the days. But you can see there's been a steady decline uh, of this. And um, in uh, some of the uh, indications almost vanished. And that is basically due to a number of factors, which I will get into in a second. Now, when you look at the center volume by location, uh, then you can see that um, with one heart lung transplant per year, most centers perform only one. Uh, there are few fewer centers that perform two, and then there are very, very few centers that perform four to nine and almost none that perform more. Um, this is now from 2010 to 18. So with our heart lung transplant that we've just recently done uh, at King Faisal Hospital, we already belong to a very, very small group of overall hospitals when, when you look at that. And we would be classified under other. So the total of other is 14. 14 hospitals are performing heart lung transplantations outside of Europe and North America. So we belong to a group of 14 now, this one. The reasons for decline is the availability of organs and the allocation. There's a huge discussion about the fact that uh, Theoretically, you can transplant three patients with one heart lung block, one heart, and one, two single lungs. Interestingly enough, no one ever makes the discussion about double versus single lung transplantation. But for heart lung patients, they're always at the disadvantage. People say, oh, I can transplant two others. You shouldn't be getting priority, this and that and here and there. And with heart transplantation mainly being urgent in most cases, a heart lung patient has almost no chance of getting an organ if they are not uh, in, in a way preferentially treated. Um, so, and this is the availability and of course the allocation. The second point is the availability of the procedure. And you've just so seen that there are not very many places where you could do that because actually you cannot do heart lung transplantation just if you can do heart transplant. And if you can do lung transplant, it's a different procedure. You really need to be able to do heart lung transplantation. Um, you cannot just put a cardiac and the thoracic surgeon together and say, slash this in, that's all very fine. Of course, they can do it, but there are a number of uh, complications and uh, quite well known complications, um, uh, includes beginning from the healing of the tracheal anastomosis and all sorts of things. Um, so, so it's not as easy as it seems. And then, of course, there are alternatives lung transplantation in cystic fibrotic patients, for instance. So that indication has vanished. And now, actually, Lung transplantation has vanished in cystic fibroid patients because of the new drugs. And then single and then lung transplantation in patients with primary pulmonary hypertension or PVOD. This is a complex procedure that needs a very experienced um, team, intensive care surroundings. But 
many of those patients who previously would have undergone heart lung transplantation now undergo double lung transplants. And then for ventricular, and then for, for pa patients with heart failure who also have type two uh, pulmonary artery hypertension and may not be eligible for lung transplantation, uh, sorry, heart transplantation per se, and would have previously gotten a heart lung transplant, they now get ventricular assist devices. The pulmonary artery pressure comes down, even if it's not reversible with medication. In the short term, it does come down. Um, and, uh, and these patients either get heart transplants or they get these ventricular assist devices as so-called destination therapy devices. So in another whole group that, uh, of patients that, that we previously would require a heart lung transplant does not anymore. And then for the future, and this is why it's in italics, that <coughs> are also moving to the arena of um, adult congenital heart disease, single ventricles and all of this, or um, we see now the advent, slow, slow advents of lung assist devices. So again, this has an impact on the, on the patients who otherwise would have to undergo uh, heart lung transplantation. And I'll show you the who. It's very sad because I have a nice little video that I would wanted to show you here of a, a patient um, actually who underwent a lung assist device implantation um, with pulmonary artery hypertension. So she had severe pulmonary artery hypertension. She would have to undergo heart lung transplantation um, for a variety of reasons. And we implanted her with a blood pressure driven uh, lung bypass oxygenator uh, in order to induce reverse remodeling of the right ventricle. And after a while on that oxygenator, also walking around with that, she underwent successful double lung transplant instead of the heart lung transplant. So again, you do all sorts of things in order to avoid that because you don't get the organ. Now, a tiny bit about the surgery. And this is, by the way, this is the youngest donor that I uh, procured for a heart lung transplant and the longest heart lung transplant that I did. At the time, the recipient was 16 months old. Um, nothing is working here. I don't know why this is. Uh, this is a Zoom problem, by the way, not my computer. So a, a little bit about the surgery. So the donor organs have to be procured on a block. So it's different from a normal heart and lung procurement. Um, and you need pulmoplegia and cardioplegia. Um, you don't perfuse both uh, with the same perfusion solution nowadays. Um, so you need to do that. Uh, you transect the trachea high and not as, um, but that is pretty much the same as you would do for a double lung procurement. Um, and for the recipient, you need to look um, at your um, access. Um, there are surgeons who either prefer a stenotomy or a clamshell in general terms, uh, but more important is uh, whether your certain patient had previous operations, whether you have, for instance, a PDA um, as a reason for the transplant, whether the patient has uh, collaterals, all sorts of things. Um, but those are the two um, different access routes. You uh, need to... Uh, protect the phrenic nerves during this operation. I've been asked whether you uh, put the lungs above or underneath the phrenic nerves. Uh, usually they are put beneath the, behind the phrenic nerves as they are uh, prior to the uh, transplantation in a natural way because the phrenic nerve pedicle can uh, impede blood flow from, from the lung actually and can lead to uh, necrosis in the organ if you completely occlude the uh, outflow uh, into the left atrium. You need to watch out for vagal nerve protection. This is pretty much similar to uh, uh, lung transplantation uh, where you can easily uh, um, clip through the or cut through the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Um, you need to watch out for collaterals. Many patients who have uh, previous surgeries or indeed have specific diseases have collaterals, and that may actually be a complete and absolute contraindications if they are not manageable. The, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. You need to be absolutely certain that you have your duct under control, um, and uh, you need to be sure that you can manage that, even if it's closed. Um, the remnants of the duct can sometimes open up. Uh, that is a point 
once you are on cardio, cardiopulmonary bypass, if your duct is open and you do certain things, you lose your bypass because you shunt into the lung and you might lose your patient. So duct control or be awareness is, is one important element of this operation. Um, and you might have to go to deep hypothermic arrest if there is indeed a duct that you cannot man, man, uh, manage easily. Um, you have to uh, be extremely diligent about the hemostasis in your posterior mediastinum. Um, that is where you win or lose your operation. Um, and then you can do either a tracheal or a bibronchial anastomosis. There are some who say the tracheal anastomosis is uh, ridden with uh, the complications. So they have turned to a bicable, uh, sorry, by bronchial anastomosis. But um, the tracheal anastomosis is actually the easier anastomosis. Because, and this is one a reason why in the beginning, lungs were also transplanted en bloc because the by bronchial anastomosis would actually get necrotic. So both have their own um, cons and pros. Uh, my, my technique is that I, if I can at all, do a uh, tracheal anastomosis. And then you can either do a bicaval or shumway anastomosis. Um, and that's the only anastomosis that you have to do uh, for the heart, obviously, other than the aorta. Um, I don't have any uh, um, interesting pictures from the operation because it's, it is not, uh, let's put it, it's not or we, we, we just never did it, and it's, it's not a lot available. There are some movies, um, videos out there, but I don't particularly like them. Now this here um, is one of those pictures of a patient whom we did transplant, but you can see here, all these, if you see my arrow, are all these are collaterals to the lung, because this patient had, uh, um, lung perfusion via the collaterals. And then you need, to, uh, you, you need to be absolutely certain that you can manage that because all these collaterals are uh, passed through the, um, through the uh, pleura. And if you do not control them initially, they retreat underneath the pleura and it's almost impossible to find them and clip them and your patient will bleed to death on the operating theater table if you don't get uh, control of that. So, so that is one of the most important things that you need to do. And actually the most important thing to do is that, is that, you, that you take your patient uh, through the right assessment process um, and uh, make sure that, that they will survive this operation. This by the way is a heart lung recipient before doing a 10K run. So the results, um, of heart lung transplantation. And you can so those who, who know their numbers know that this is pretty close to uh, a lung transplantation. The median survival in lung transplantation is higher, but there's a, uh, the reason for that is that there is a uh, initial drop off here that lung transplantation doesn't have. The conditional median survival is pretty much the same, 11.2 years. And indeed long-term um, lung transplantation survival is mainly dictated by lung function and bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, or CLAD nowadays. Now, when you look at the different diagnoses, uh, sorry, when you look at the uh, different eras, then it has gotten better over time, 2010 to 2017. Um, and then you can also see that the median survival has gone from 3.6 to 6.5 years, and the conditional survival has also gone up. When you look at the different diagnoses, then the best survival is uh, in pulmonary hypertensive patients who are not idiopathics. Um, and the CF patients, the CF patients used to get heart-lung transplants and their hearts used to be then transplanted as a domino transplant into somebody else. Um, but uh, that transplantation has pretty much vanished. And it's when you look at the numbers, it's not the highest number anyways. Um, the uh, idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension um, is not depicted on there, but this it's, is not that bad either. Um, but you see here, the best obviously is the, the pulmonary hypertensive group. And when you look at that conditional survival to one year, and I think this is interesting when you look at pulmonary artery hypertension, 
then your conditional survival about if you've survived one year is actually 13 years, which I think is not so bad when you look at a patient who otherwise does not have any other options. Um, and this is one of the most impressive heart lung transplant recipients, Kate Phillips, who actually competed in uh, an Ironman triathlon. So with heart lung transplantation, you can do what everybody else can do, Ironman triathlon, climb mountains, we know that now, scuba dive, whatever, have a normal job. You can have children. Um, the patients did have successful motherhood with that and all that. So uh, in my world, it remains an absolutely fascinating operation. It's rare, it doesn't happen very often. We will try to do it more often for those patients who need it here. But uh, when we've done our first one, and currently the patient's doing fine and it's getting closer to leaving the hospital, but um, it is uh, definitely one of the rare occurrences. That's all I have. I hope my voice isn't too bad. <clears throat> it's getting better, but I'm sitting at home with COVID. So, and this is also why the, this is maybe not the most polished presentation, but once again, eh, it is not my fault that the pictures did not come up properly. That must be a Zoom problem. I'm sorry for that. But please, um, if you have any questions, please bug me now. Thank you very much, Dr. Simon, for this uh, amazing and uh, uh, extraordinary presentation. And uh, we really appreciate your presence, although that you are uh, uh, sick and uh, having COVID. Uh, we really appreciate your time and expertise. And uh, again, congratulations on the, your recent case of uh, heart lung transplant uh, last week. Uh, maybe uh, I'd like to start uh, the questions with the question about the domino heart lung transplant. Uh, um, I know you touched uh, upon it uh, briefly, but uh, do you st uh, what do you think of it? And is it only when there is uh, anatomical uh, uh, um, problem uh, with the shifting of the heart? And what indications for it are usually done? So, so th that's a historical event. They used to transplant um, cystic fibrotic patients with heart lung blocks because they were afraid uh, of certain things. Uh, but then they usually had this very good heart left over. Um, and also very often cystic fibrotic patients had a bit higher pulmonary artery pressures. So the right ventricle was strained. So then you could transplant this heart into a second recipient. It's only availability. Um, once you started to do um, double lung transplants in cystic fibrotic patients, which were vastly superior actually uh, in the, in, because of the availability and all of that um, ease of operation, that ceased to exist. Having said that, I know a couple of people who, one, one man who has the heart of the other man. So it's the only, I think they're pretty much, I, th I think they're the only ones who are still alive where, and they play football together. So uh, they, they know each other. So, so the, the one guy had cystic fibrosis and has a heart lung transplant and he plays football with the guy who has his heart, which is a bit odd, but very interesting. But the domino transplants, have pretty much stopped since then. Although, having said that, we are reconsidering it uh, because um, we might get heart lung transplants for people with is some pulmonary hypertension and a very healthy heart. And we might then transplant that heart into the heart recipient we would then, we, what we would do is we would list those two recipients together, one who needs a lung transplant and one who needs a heart transplant and list those two recipients together for one heart lung transplantation. This way you could do both transplants because you could probably not transplant the donor heart into the recipient with the pulmonary, who also has some pulmonary hypertension because of left heart failure. So that way with the domino transplant, you can again transplant two people, but this is a new concept coming back because of donor availability or lack thereof. Um, and whether we can implement that is another question because uh, it's surgically a huge, huge undertaking, but uh, we are looking into that. Thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, well, that would be an amazing idea or something out of the box, uh, actually. Regarding the harvesting of the uh, of the organ of the heart lung in block, uh, while taking out the recipient's heart and lung, um, uh, I've seen that you're uh, uh, taking it out as a block versus taking the heart and then the lung. Wouldn't that make it easier in terms of uh, the section? No. Because you need you need to you need to uh, put them in as a block too. You cannot you don't want to dissect uh, transect the heart of of the lung. So um, then you the, the surgery. About the recipients. About the recipients. Yeah. The, oh, you mean oh, on the recipient side? That's that's start, that's a person. Well, um, the reason why I I take the heart lung out as a block within the recipient is that it is less bleeding. If you Take the lungs out and then the heart out. It's it's a lot more. It's it's a it's messier than than taking it out as one block. Um, when if if you you during this operation until we came of cardiopulmonary bypass, we did not need a single blood product. We needed blood products afterwards for a variety of reasons. One of them was that we had some bleeding, but. Uh, um, uh, during uh, the uh, during the um, uh, preparation of the heart lung block in the recipient and that removal, we did not need a single a single um, a blood product. So that is why I do it that way. And I have seen for myself no no difference, um, significant difference in time. It doesn't get any quicker if I just chop off the lung. Actually, it gets slower because then I have all the bleeding from the mediastinum. The bronchial arteries, um, all these things don't bleed if you leave them alone. Everything that you do not cut does not bleed. So uh, when I take the heart lung block out, I have minimal tissue dissection and therefore minimal bleeding. That's the reason why I do that. I see. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Uh, any more questions from the audience uh, about uh, the topic? Okay, then it seems like uh, there's a lot <coughs> more, more questions. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Simon, for your time, and really appreciate it. And we hope to have you here again in our academic activity. And uh, by that, we conclude our session for today. Thank you, everyone.